Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new interview from MinMax. MinMax is a place about games, friends, and getting better. My name is Ben Hansen. Thank you for being here. Today's interview is with the one and only Tim Schaefer from Double Fine. Not only was he just inducted into the Dice Hall of Fame, but he was also the star, one of the stars of the new documentary, Double Fine Psych Odyssey, that is all about the development of Psychonauts The Rhombus of Ruin and Psychonauts 2. It is a gigantic 32-part series. It's free on YouTube. Please go watch it if you haven't. But I'm very excited to talk to Tim Schafer today about everything about the documentary, behind the scenes of the behind the scenes of the behind the scenes. We've been unpacking Double Fine Psych Odyssey all week long here at MinMax. We've had the celebration of Double Fine Psych Odyssey, where we've had interviews with two-player productions, the film crew. We've had industry discussions, our own spoilerific discussions about uh, the overall documentary. We just... There's a lot to unpack here. Uh, we really are impressed by this thing. It is an unbelievably honest and long and raw and beautiful look at every aspect of game development and how so much of it comes down to humans and human interactions. So please watch that if you haven't. We hope you enjoy this interview with Tim Schafer. If you've watched the documentary, I think you'll get some insight out of this interview. If you enjoy it, if you've enjoyed MinMax celebrating the Double Fine Psych Odyssey in such a big way, you can always help us out by subscribing to our YouTube channel. It's free. It's a small small act from you. It's a big thing for us. Or if you want to support us directly and help support independent games media directly, you can go to patreon.com slash minmax with two N's where you can unlock the podcast version of this interview, all of our other interviews, and then also the deepest dives, which are our huge community game club discussions. Right now we're going through Like a Dragon Ishin, giving it the best, most thorough discussion on the internet, truly the discussion that game deserves. And we're going to be tackling Resident Evil 4's remake coming up soon. So you can unlock the podcast version of those huge, elaborate discussions, which are very fun, or submit comments for us to read as well. We'd appreciate the support. But hey, without further ado, here's Tim Schaefer for the grand finale of the celebration of Double Fine Psych Odyssey from MinMax. Tim Schaefer, welcome to MinMax, sir. Hello. <laughs> is this the show? Are we doing the show? Yeah, this is the show. This is, uh, this okay, is as live as we get right here. Turn on my hey face. I was, I've been sick. Should warn, can you tell? Look at no. my face. No, you, you seem great. You seem spry. You seem energetic. You seem ready to communicate with people again. This is, this is you ready to go, man. I've been locked in the downstairs back room of my house. I came back from Dice. Yeah. And I was like, let me just go into the back room where we have some COVID tests and do a test. And it was like the first, after all these years of being so good and so careful, yeah. being the only person masking at Dice, came back with a positive COVID test. So I've been just locked in this oh, downstairs God. room. It's like the first time I've come upstairs because my wife and, and my kids at school, and my wife is gone. So I can like creep up here, even though I got a, I got a negative test today. So fingers yeah. crossed I won't rebound, but I'll just pretend I, I'm a lot healthier than I look. Okay. Did you immediately go back to like programming Atari games? Like it seems like you spending time by yourself. There's a nice theme in the documentary, at least, where it seems like, hey, this is a pretty sweet life you got going on here, man. That was a DH. Yeah, we, uh, that was a, I, I did learn to like, if I'm going to be in this place, I want to surround it with things that like don't stress me out and make me happy. And I have a new office now. I moved to this new house. Yeah. It's a little, it's still like a little closet, but I can shut the door. Ooh. I still have a little bed for cats over there and all the old Atari games over there. Nice. Uh, but I do kind of miss like during the quarantine days, I had a lot of time for hobbies, like, like jigsaw puzzles and making Atari games. And now it's like people want to do stuff. Yeah. Again, well, you weekends? need some Weird. quiet time with a Rubik's Cube. Really get to know it a little bit over there, man. Of course. Of course. There we go. Uh, congratulations on the Dice Hall of Fame. Jeez, that's huge. Uh, dude, on the what? On the whole Dice Hall of Fame. What? Oh, oh my God. God. Oh, it's right, right here. That's so thank you. I want to thank everyone at MinMax. I want to thank Ben. <laughs> I want to thank Ben's parents. I want to thank all the um, people watching. And sorry, I told you, I'm not really impacted yet. <laughs> It's just happened. That's just amazing. Happened. Uh, that, that's a hell of an honor. Congratulations. Um, it's really, it pales a comparison to getting this documentary out the door, though. So hats off, Jesus, for launching Psych Odyssey. Does it feel like another game launch or how does it feel from your perspective? <laughs> it's such an interesting project because it's something that by, you know, by the skill of two player, we almost forget about it a little right. bit. Like they're, they're, they, they just are in, you saw in the doc, there's a scene where like, he is like, did you see that? Were you at that meeting? Like we have to ask ourselves, <laughs> Are, are are the cameras there or not? Like, I'm, I'm personally so used to it. And then it's always shocking to see a new person get the mic clipped on and be like, oh, that's right. This is weird, isn't it? Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I talked to you player a little bit about that, about that idea of like, I mean, it must come up pretty early in all your job interviews for Double Fine of just, hey, by the way, how comfortable are you with this? There's going to be people roaming around filming every meeting. Well, we should probably honestly be better about that. I think it's, we kind of assume people have seen the documentaries and know about the company, you know, right. or done, looked at our YouTube channel once, you know, and know what's coming up. And but we do we do talk about it um, 
you know, and the, the, we introduce everyone in the first meeting, and everyone has like a mic clipped on. They know, they know it's happening. And if they have a big problem with it, they can tell two player to. Like if you saw their Minecraft documentary, there's a person with like a CG face has like a Minecraft block. Right, on his head. right. So we never went that extreme, but we can um, work around people's because it is, it is, it is a very exposing thing. Like you feel yeah. very exposed. Yeah, I mean, after close to a decade of it yourself now, just them having filmed you. I mean, do you feel like you are one to one? You're as comfortable in meeting with them filming versus not, or is it just adding like a subtle ten to twenty percent of pressure even for you? I mean, I always am usually, I'm usually comfortable with them filming. I, the only time I ask them not to be in a room when it's really unfair, like if I was, if I was having a performance review with someone, right, it would right. really be unfair to have the documentary crew film it. You know, yeah. there's, there's things like that that are just not, you can't really do as an employer. It's wrong, you know, but it, to their credit and two player will take immense satisfaction from this because I've never told them this. The only meeting, creative meeting I asked them not to attend, I uh, was the very beginning there, the, the, I hadn't didn't have anyone on the team. I was like, I want to do second house too. I brought up Pendleton Ward and Eric Wilpaw to a, a double funds office, and we brainstormed in the back room uh, for like a week or something. it was a long time, a few days, maybe just a couple of days. I don't know. But I was like, I'm not ready to start. I mean, just mostly just kind of you know out of the habit of being filmed, and I I didn't want to really influence the kind of delicate like it's like the most delicate brainstorming, the first one. Like, what is this game? Right. Like, what's how are we gonna make this game cool? And these like the two. Crazy, most creative people I know, right? Eric Wolf on Pendleton Ward. Uh, let's just let's not film it because I don't want to affect it. And um, and I really regret it because man, that would be a fun mo meeting to watch now. Yeah. That'd be a fun meeting to look back on and what were our first thoughts about second house two. And it turned out we didn't use anything. <laughs> we, for some reason, we were just it turned out to be a complete bust. We just couldn't think that that meeting came up with nothing except for this one terrible idea of the movies of the game starting with Raz um, being pushed through a hospital on the gurney because he's pregnant. Right. And it was like, like this, we can't do this. But Penn storyboarded it, and it's like an Easter egg in the game. And but, maybe um, like the hospital thing stuck with you in some weird way to carry through to the final game. Yeah, it was since there was. Oh my God, you're right. right. All right, you're yeah. right. We should we should probably pay those guys after all. Uh, yeah, not to immediately start on like a hey, where was this thing? But I was surprised that Eric Wolpa wasn't in the documentary or on the project. I mean, it was in the fig pitch, and then it seemed like a big theme throughout the documentary is like, I am drowning in all this writing. I have barricaded my door to try and get this writing done. But it's like, hey, Eric was supposed to help with writing, right? Like, whatever happened to that? Yeah. You can tell I have a big problem with writing. Like I, uh, um, I mean, it just it never really worked out timing wise to have Eric on mostly because you can see the project was often in this like a difficult place to bring in someone to like okay yeah here's all this there's a lot of stuff going on I gotta tell you this <laughs> and try to imagine that meshing you know like in the first game I had already written all the cutscenes for the like the this main story was already done and Eric came and wrote in some level stuff like Lungfishopolis is all his funny gags about the puppy orphanage and stuff and right. the, the 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 states of the kids in the campground. So it was like having him come in and do that kind of like color, like add color and, and stuff was it never felt like we were, uh, you know, <laughs> at that stage of adding color. It always seemed like we were still building the basic uh, bridge across the canyon, you know, and and just it was it just didn't it didn't time out right. OK. All right. Maybe DLC you still can pull him in at some point. You never know. I mean, he does have a job. He does have I a guess, job. I guess. He has been working this whole time. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. from your perspective, you know, two players is filming so much. It feels like they're just flies on the wall at this point. Um, how hard was it from your perspective to get this documentary out the door? I mean, it, give me your biggest challenge for making this whole thing happen. Um, uh, I mean, I don't work on it. It's pretty, I just like <laughs> let them film. And oh, right. It's, it is stressful because I care about it. Like I believe, and they I, they might have, they have their own mission statement. And my mission, like I believe in the mission of, of pulling back the curtain and showing what it's like to work on a video game, the good and the bad and everything of it um, mm -hmm. for a lot of different reasons. And um, so I care a lot about it. And we care a lot about them being like, just, just like care about all the creative people working on Psychons too. They're their own, they're their own creative force. And I want to make sure they're, uh, we're, we're doing everything we can to allow them to realize their vision as, as well as we want the game to be realized, you know? Um, so we try to, to provide for that and get out of their way. And, um, you know, I tried to, the best thing I did to help was like, stop asking them for favors. Cause usually it's like, Hey, can you film this video for recruiting? Like we have oh, a fun. video on like every video you see on our site is mostly made by them. So like that, Hey, get a job. Like that, that recruiting video we have is all shot by them. And yeah. all our Kickstarter back, you know, all our videos are shot by them, but it's just kind of like, Oh, I have this great idea for a funny video. We get, okay. I'll leave you guys alone. You seem pretty busy. <laughs> you seem pretty busy. But it's still, it must add so much tension to the studio and everything's just 
flowing up to you. I mean, imagine there's a couple of conversations at least with people just going to you and be like, hey, this filming, f this, this sucks. Uh, this is way too stressful to have them filming all the time. And for you to protect it, I guess, is more where I'm coming from. For you to shepherd this thing through seems mind boggling to me. I mean, um, some people don't like it. Yeah. And we try not to film them, try not to bug it. There are other projects that, um, you know, don't get filmed. You know, when you don't see um, much filming of, of Lee's projects. And I don't think he's, that, he's as into the, he's into, I don't think he, I don't think that's his personal mission, it's mine. You know what I mean? I think he, um, he, you know, maybe that's why his games get done faster than the lack of documentary. <laughs> Can I blame this whole thing on two player? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, and there are some people, like some of the newer people on the project, like like um, Zach would not like a lot of certain meetings get, get filmed. Right. And, um, but that's fine. You know what I mean? We just, we don't want to make anyone, we don't want the documentary to ever interfere with people's jobs. So right. we, they want to just slide in where they can unobtrusively and not like affect. The worst thing they could do is like affect what's going on yeah although it did have a huge effect on, on broken age naturally yeah, people watching it, but not because of that because of them and then the um people watching would come back to us and it kind of painted us into a corner in terms of what we could do with that game yeah yeah that's a tough one um yeah i'm just curious about that idea of where <laughs> where this push for radical truth comes from with you i know that's too lofty of a statement but I think it'd be very uh, easy for a lot of people. Of, well, a lot of people in your position. Crazy person. <laughs> why are you crazy? I guess is the, the core of it. No, but I think a lot of people in your position would be like, hey, it's great to film the development of a game, but let's yeah. trim this. This is uncomfortable. Of course we trim that. I look like a jackass here. Trim this. And so like, what what is it in your past that is pushing so hard to show so many different sides of all the people that work for you? Great question. I mean, I was like, I was watching. I watched. Have you heard the show Min Max? Min Max show. Oh yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah. all right. And these. First of all, I had to, some. I I got it. It's so nice that you love the two player documentary. I've been enjoying so much of your coverage of it. Yeah. And just between you, we gotta tone it down. We gotta tone it down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just. Just for us and our safety, I think you love it so much, and it's so great to see two players get the love they deserve. But that first one where you had the podcast with uh, Kelsey and the other yeah. folks. Uh, and you're talking about how much you loved it. And I could just see the like anger and boredom building on everyone's faces. The more you talked about it, they're like, Ben, shut up about this documentary. Yeah, and that's you're going to get the two player guys beat up after school. You know, <laughs> because the teacher likes it. So just, so just, okay. Just back to saying it's, it's okay. It's fine. It's okay. It's okay. Documentary. It's yeah, it's fine. fine. Yeah. We're it's happy. It's that's there. great. That's great. That's very believable. Take no, it or leave it. To be uh, it is so nice. Cause they, it has been so much work and stress for them and they're going to be processing, I think for a while. Uh, but, um, you know, we get a lot of attention for the game and stuff and two player doesn't get as much attention for all the work they do. So it's great to see them get that attention. But yeah. what we're talking about, I was watching that excellent podcast you did with some friends and, um, you were talking about why did they release this? And from a PR perspective, why would anyone ever share these things with the world? Uh, and I was amazed by like, you're listening, I was listening to this is like, how have we all been so trained yeah. that this stuff is not okay to talk about? Right. Like why, why have we all journalists included internalized that this is really touchy stuff that we can't talk about. You know what I mean? Like this stuff is fine to talk about, you know? And, and part of it was two player did work at a, a, a major publishing place once. They did a video for a making of a big, 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 big game. Mm -hmm. And they were just told to take all this stuff out. And I was just listening to their stories of having to take this stuff out. And I was like, that's so, that would have made it so much more interesting, you know, to watch. Yeah. And it wouldn't have made me like the game any less, but we, we feel like it has to be this really syrupy, sweet story of success every time. That's three S's. We, um, or you won't like the game somehow. You'll affect the sales of the game. And I feel like it's the opposite. Like we've seen uh, more people playing the game since the documentary came out. We've seen more people applying to work at Double Fine yeah. than before the game doc came out. It's like the truth is, um, is the truth, I don't know if that sounds right. The truth is good. It's a good thing when the truth comes out. Because um, a, a complicated story is is people are, are less likely to just reject it as, as, as uh, uh, some sort of marketing tale. You, right. can, you watch him making a thing and you're like, nah, it's not. Look at that guy in the corner. He's mad. Yep. He doesn't like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. so you got to like have me tell my story and also the team tell their story. Right. And if I'm in there, we're like, it's not true. What they're saying, they really, they love that change I made. The whole team loves that change <laughs> I made. You know, it's going to seem pretty pretty stupid yeah I, I think from our perspective like you know working at game informer for so many years and going on all these uh, cover story trips you're working with pr and development teams and publishers when they're maybe at their most stressful point of like pretty early on in the game's reveal marketing push and everything like that and so it's just 
it was definitely just drilled into my soul of just every publisher yeah. wants to be as careful as possible at all times. We have the people that can speak about the game and then we have definitely their talking points. And so just, I think just after a decade of everybody on pins and needles to just have this documentary drop and not give a shit, <laughs> like in a very healthy way, it just, it's remarkable. Well, it's, it's just shocking do, compared to everything else. Yeah, I do give a shit. And I, yes, do, yes. I think it just ultimately, I'm proud of how it looks, you know, and for everyone like my, for the Jason Shars the world to think I'm not a good leader anymore. Oh, mm -hmm. here we go. Here deal we with go. That. Yep. I, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, I'll, I'll talk to him later. <laughs> um, he, uh, I'm incredibly proud of what the team did and I'm happy with my own performance, believe it or not. And that's yeah. because I know what I was faced with and I know what I had to work with and I know the choices I made and they definitely made a lot of mistakes and they're all there on film to see. And there's things I regret and could do differently, but I also know why I did some things and why some things were kind of more like forced errors, you know, and, um, and I, you know, I still feel like we pulled off amazing, amazing thing. And, you know, we shipped this game, we shipped, it's turned out to be really good. Um, we never missed a payroll. And yeah. even though you see high profile people leaving during the production, the team that shipped that game is mostly still at Double Fine and working there and not has not stabbed me with a thousand daggers yet, <laughs> except for, you know, mean slack comments. But right. other than that, they, it, I'm not saying it's perfect, you know, but I'm saying I know the like, nothing is perfect. You wouldn't believe it if it was perfect. And um, I feel like this is what I, I say this to people a lot when they talk about imposter syndrome, like, because, you know, I have had people who talk about, oh, I feel am I doing a good job? Should I have this job? Maybe I'm messing up. Maybe I should quit. And even I, you know, like I have those feelings during when things are really bad in a project, I'm like, oh, God, why do I have this job? I'm messing up so bad. And then you, <laughs> this might sound dumb, but I have this, you know, realization that like, of course, I'm messing this up, but someone else would just be messing it up differently, you know? This, we are all imposters in that way. Like there's anyone who has a job is going to make a certain amount of mistakes. I can live with the ones that I make because I'm going to honestly try to make them better. And and also, like someone told me once, if you're trying to make the world a better place, you have to be loud about your mistakes. You have to share your mistakes with the world. And if you're honestly trying to be make them better and do better next time so that everybody can learn from them and they don't all have to go through that pain. So that's what we're trying to do is be loud with our mistakes and the triumphs because that team is a very... A triumphant team, I believe. Yeah. Um, so did you watch stuff along the way? Do you try and stay fresh until they say, all right, Mr. Schaefer, here's a dump of 22 hours of footage for you to go through? What is that like? Uh, exactly. You what I they dumped at least 20 hours. Um, wait till the end, you know, because like we want it, it's their work of art and I don't want to have any undue influence on it. Um, we, we, I wrote, I watch every single episode and just made notes on things. Cause some of it is like just honest, creative feedback of like, I don't understand what this character is talking about here. Right. Like I don't even call them characters. Like, you um, said character. Yeah. Two floor punches called them characters too. I think it's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's, well, it's I mean, warped, you're, you, know? you are, you do have one lover of abstraction. If you're telling yep. a story, you know, they're people, but you're also like, they're, they're, they are separate. They're the, you know, James as a human being, James Marion and James Marion, the character in the documentary are two different people as we all are. Everyone is. And, and so they become a character when they're on, you know, it's important, I think, to actually have that level of abstraction. But what was it talking about? Characters? Oh, uh, you're taking notes know? saying, oh, this character is such and such. Oh, yeah, I'm going to make a note that I don't know what they're referencing. They reference something and it sounds like someone else. I mean, there's some basic nuts and bolts things that I could make comments on. Right. And then there's, uh, there was one time where I was like, this, it would be really mean to leave this person, this a couple of people out of the documentary. They're like, I mean, looking back at it, I wish I had sent them a, a list of the team members, like, make sure they're all in. Make sure they're all in. This is a <laughs> personal favor to me. Like, don't hurt that. Because the sad thing is, like, you get, there's some people who aren't in the documentary because they just didn't make enough trouble. Like, they just did a great job. Right. And, like, and maybe I don't want to name their names because maybe they asked to not be in the documentary. And I don't know. But um, there's some people who just, like, quietly and you see in the doc you see people are fighting in these 10 cents meetings and it'll cut to somebody modeling this character who, that shipped in the game you're like even despite all this kind of like the project spinning its wheels over here there's all these people just kind of getting all this cool stuff made and it you know changed form by you know and it got rearranged right. but it shipped in the game and so um i like to see all those things represented in the game as much as possible yeah do you um what, what's your feeling when you're booting up the documentary for the first time and watching the last six or seven years of your life is it dread is it excitement what's it like uh, i watched i've watched it all the way through three times wow <laughs> i watched it through the first time when they just showed it to me and i tried to catch uh like everyone's trying to catch things like we have we had once the password to our internal server 
you know, post-it noted on the okay. computer in the background. Like, we got to catch that stuff, like a background screen that has passwords or something on it. Um, but I watched it first time, like, with dread, absolute dread, because, like, there was so much pain and trauma on the project. I was like, I don't want to see this. I don't right. want to watch it. And how are they going to handle this? And how are they going to handle that? And I was very nervous because these are people's lives and, and you know, might have an effect on them and their careers if they, when this thing is shared. But then I watched it, and then I was, like, really relieved in that, I was like, you know, thinking about Paul Owens doing the final edit and like, I go, oh, they're trying to tell a story about how creative people work together and make some a collaborative work of art. Right. You know, and, and the human beings and the humanity of that process. They're not out to like tell some sort of like reality TV drama fest. There's no like cut to someone flipping the table and screw Like they're not, they're not trying to pump up all the, because the, there are stuff they could find things and they could get people to talk bad about each other behind their backs and stuff like that. Right. And you can make that kind of documentary and those exist and those gather a lot of attention because they're scandalous and stuff. I'm like, no, that's, and then I realized that that's not their way. That's not, that's not what these uh, guys are after with this documentary. They want to be like, how does someone, you know, have a vision for something? How do they share that with other people? How do the other people, how do you get everybody's ideas into it? And how do you pick the best ones? And how do you get back on track when you're not on track? And, and all that stuff is really what the documentary is about. And I don't think anyone comes off as being irredeemable or a villain or um, right. anything like that. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, uh, I remember... Even me, Jason. <laughs> Jason Schreier. We hope you're watching Jason Schreier. No, it's yeah. interesting. Like Peter Jackson, when he was talking about uh, Get Back, like the Beatles documentary, he said that his first conversation with Paul McCartney was like, yeah, by the way, I watched all of the raw footage from filming that album and Paul McCartney, he said that he looks scared and he's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And he just also had that feeling of dread. And he's like, no, no, it's, it turns out it's a lot better and more human than you remember. I know you remember it as being the downfall of the band, but there's still a lot of heart there. So yeah. there was some fear just about how, what's it gonna be like to relive some of these pretty tense moments. Yeah, and that's why the difference is with the first viewing was dread. The second viewing, I was kind of frustrated because I was doing, I was doing more, it's an amazing post-mortem tool, right? And be able oh, to see yeah. a project being made just as a manager. You know, you're watching like, oh, watch, look at me doing that. And then, oh, there's that meeting I was in. Oh God, I wish I'd seen that a couple of years ago. And um, so I was kind of like post morning some things and, and wanting to make some changes and doing some things. But then the third time through was all like love and acceptance for me. Cause I was just like, apart from all those things that are hard on the project, look at, look at all these amazing people just being together and doing amazing work together yeah you know it's just it's just it's still inspiring to me to watch uh, watch the team work what um on your first time through what was your biggest takeaway what did you learn that you didn't know before even though you were at the center of this entire project hey i want to talk about <laughs> i want to talk about the documentary but i still feel as an employer talking about people's individuals seems a little dicey for me sure but i you know my biggest regret of the project was um you know, not not realizing that um, our old friend Anna was at that much risk of leaving. Like, yeah. I had heard her feedback. I was like, okay, that sounds like something I should give feedback on. I talked to somebody. Is it getting better? Yeah, it's getting better. And then, and then you hear like, well, maybe it's not getting better. Okay, I should work on that. And then she was gone. And I was like, well, how did I miss that? She's been there for so long. And in my head, I was like, we've been through so much worse stuff than we've been through so many things, you know, together that we've so many problems that we fixed. And I'm um, surely I thought I had more time than that to fix it. And then I watched the documentary and I watched these meetings that I'm not in. And I'm like, oh, God. So, yeah. It's two players' fault for not showing me that footage. That's. <laughs> Do you <laughs> ever. Like, Should we show this to Tim? And the other Paul is like, no, no. This would be better for the documentary <laughs> if she leaves. I'm kidding. I mean, are you ever walking by him in the hall though and just being like hey how do you feel like things are going to player i mean they do have an amazing bird's eye view and it's like they they could have maybe connected some dots behind the string behind the scenes and made some I and mean, i'm sure what they saw they were like well i'm sure this will be solved by someone else it's not our job to manage yeah, this company right right, right. i was kidding about that it's really not their job but um i think there are a couple of times where i've missed a meeting and i heard people complaining about it and i've thought about asking hey can i see a video of this meeting yeah and then i'm like is that okay? Because now this is becoming a surveillance tool of management. You know, the documentary is not supposed to be that. Interesting. So if I start asking for surveillance of footage of the team working when I'm not around, that starts to feel a little... Um, that's why it's really important to have a separate entity of two-player where I don't I don't get the first cut. I don't, and right. I don't tell them what stories to tell. Because then it is kind of like Big Brother's watching you while you're working. Right. 
Tim, it's almost like there's a lot of aspects and facets to this documentary, and that's why I can't stop thinking about it and talking about it because it's a wild, weird thing you all well, accomplished. You can talk about it with you like it with me. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, just good. not one your other buddies who like other things. Or... Right. Just stop boring Kelsey Lewin by rambling on about it. Okay. Well, she seemed like she was watching it. Though she seemed like she yeah, she was watching. digging it actually. Um, are, so there's there's situations like you know um, where you started going out to with uh, start, started going out to lunch with a bunch of folks from the team, kind of to try and reassess where things are at and stuff. And it's interesting to see that. It, do you feel like that's kind of you relearning lessons or learning them for the first time about like, okay, I need to actually zoom in more and really focus on what these people are dealing with on a day-to-day basis? Wait, wait, the, are, the, are you saying in the doc they're showing me go to lunch with people? Because I don't think that was not in the doc, was it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not actually filmed, but it's talking about yeah. you going out to lunch with folks to try and yeah. reassess what's going on after, after Zach yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... Um, I mean, I'll be postmorning this game for the rest of my life. Yep. But it was, it you know, I, talk, I joke a lot about it being the exact same thing as the first game, all the same problems and stuff like that in the in the rap party speech and stuff because there are these funny things where you can, you know, poor Dave Russell. He's like, you think it'll be easier this time? And he's like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that gets shown so many times in every trailer. Is Dave Russell? He's like, oh yeah, it'll be easier. <laughs> um, by the way, Dave Russell doesn't cause any doesn't cause any trouble. It doesn't appear right, as much. Right, right. Documentary should be about him. Hey, how'd you do such a great job? Anyway. Um, <laughs> but uh, so so there's this way in which certain things seem to be, be repeating themselves. But it actually was completely different in a, yeah. in a major major way. And it was a very unusual project for Double Fine in that the project totally got away from our values as a company in the middle of it, which is what I discovered through this whole process. Right. So, um, like the first second of this game had all these terrible obstacles and mess ups and, 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 and hardships, but that team that shipped that game loved each other and loves each other now. Like we still like had this fondness and, and not, you know, not just cause we're bonded by this, uh, going through this, uh, terrible thing together, but, um, there was a great affection and respect among everyone who worked on the thing. Right. And that's the biggest thing I felt, you know, and the, and the same, like brutal legend was a much more stable and, um, predictable uh, still long um and still lost our publishers so that's just kind of the theme but like um there's still a lot of respect and affection between the team on that too and this is the first one i was like wow there are people on this team that hate each other how are we gonna get around this and it was um it, it, it's shocking to be like you think you're so much smarter and better after 20 years of doing something you'll just never make those mistakes again but right there were new mistakes there are, even if you you you, you, you may be did something right the first time and didn't write it down why you did it. And you don't really remember why you did it right. So you do, mm, let's try this new different way of doing things. And then it blows up and you're like, oh, that's why we, that's why we used to do things that way. Um, but we had, I mean, it's a weird, it's a weird makeup because we hired a lot of people to work on. It didn't feel like we we're hiring people really fast. In fact, it felt like we we're hiring people really slowly, but we ended up with a large amount of new people on the team and all, all the conflicts that went on, like none of them were between two old timers. There was not a right, single right. conflict between two old timers at all. There were two old timers who had issues with one of the newer people. And then every other single conflict was between, um, between two new people or three new people on the yeah. project. So the, the people that we'd hired were fighting with each other, except for the people who were you know, maybe upset with me, but, um, and it was it was so that was so strange to see. And at first, I was trying to deal with it by like dealing with the feedback that this person, you know, if you're trying to summarize what um, their problem was, like they're like the oh, this person's acting like a jerk. And it's and it's like hard to give feedback to someone like don't be such a jerk. Try right. not to be a jerk. Try and break it down. But a lot of it, it took me a while to process that the jerkedness was like they weren't respecting a lot of our really important core values. Like we have a value about mutual respect. Everyone on the team shows each other this mutual respect and we don't have these this factionalism and territorialism like we i've had in other projects um in the past back at lucas they're like programmers versus the artists fighting all the time it's like we are lucky programmers are really lucky to have artists of this caliber working with them and the artists are lucky to have audio people of that caliber and then every and the producers and everybody just respects each other so much and that's what makes a lot of it work and um there's other values that like everybody on the team gets to be heard. Everyone on the team gets to be heard. Now they're, no matter what their title is, no matter what their job is in the office, they can have a creative idea for the game. They can have a feedback about the way something's happening on the game and they're heard and they're not dismissed out of hand and like told them, you know, be quiet and stuff like that. Right. And you can see meetings um, like that's, you know, two of those things are just not being done. And um, that, and, but then people were, you know, 
a lot of the um, new people were like, why do you do things in this way? And like a, a lot of the old timers are like, that's just how we've always done it. And that's when I realized that's how we can do better as old timers. It's like, we should actually write this down. So I was embarrassed to realize like, we don't have our core values written down anywhere. It's just something when you're around a long time as a company, you're just right. kind of like, everyone, this is how we do it. Everyone knows how we do things. We just treat each other with respect and we, you know, everyone gets their ideas heard and you just live your values every day. So you don't think you have to write them down. So I was like, we had so many new people. I wish I had written them all down and we talked about it so that because normally you just take on 1% of time and they kind of, they see some difference between how they used to do things and the weird way that we do things. And they kind of decide whether they want to adjust and, and really join the company or not. But if you're taking a bunch of people, there are so many people with this other way of doing things that it kind of like just knock the project off its rails as far as our values go. And not, it didn't derail the train and make it crash, but it kind of like, right. you know, like your model train gets the wheels off the track and just becomes all bumpy and noisy. And you're just like, why yeah. is this project so bumpy and noisy? And how do I get it back on the... So we kind of got shifted off of our, our values as a company by the kind of just a big center of gravity of, of, not, of people not upholding right. what we didn't tell them were our values. And I know, I don't want to make this the next hour of the discussion, but I mean, this is the theme of the overall documentary, but just the question is, can you uphold those values to the highest standards and still have a smooth, relatively fast production? Or does the, do the values inherently slow the production down to such a degree that there's just no way around it? I mean, I believe those values are what allow us to make, uh, we weren't slowed down by the values. We were slowed down by the people who weren't respecting those values. Yeah. You know what I mean? Trying to make things like, let's do things more by fiat and more by spec and more by the siloed, like I'll figure this out and hand it off to you and you figure that out. Like that was what was not creating um, a weird thing, like a second level. Well, to be fair, like Double Fine does things strangely, and um, my projects are strange at Double Fine. And then within my projects, Psychonauts games are the weirdest because, like, every level has so many, it's so loaded with what it has to deliver creatively. Um, and it's, um, I'm just, I'm just postponing the whole project. But uh, anyway, it, <laughs> um, it, what was the question? Uh, there's so many different angles that you have to take with this. So inherently it's going to feel, I don't know, slower, weirder. The idea of oh, having a, a yeah. smooth process, but still up no, the values. It feels slow to someone who wants, like, we got to move. Gabriel says we decide this thing. And I'm like, we don't have the time to do this wrong. Because mm -hmm. what's going to happen is if we don't, like, we listen to everybody's opinions and we actually, you know, some things are easy to decide and some things you want everyone to talk about for a while until you feel like you all agree on, like, this is, this is right. This is the thing we like. This is cool. And people will try to head that off early. And when they do, it goes off and then it always comes back again. Cause like, Oh, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? No one liked it. We did it. No one liked it. Cause we didn't think about it enough, you know, at right. this stage. Yeah. Right. And twice cut once. That's it. Uh, th this is again, this is the downside of being so public with games development is watching it. Everybody's like, you know, a little, uh, I don't know, backseat drivering. Like, I wonder why didn't they just do this? But something I was wondering about watching this documentary is when you got to a point of like, okay, let's design a level, like the Bob Z level. We need to come up with a theme. Uh, I don't know, hanging plant. And everyone's just trying out these new ideas. But it's like, I had just watched you with a stack of note cards filled with amazing ideas, like sitting yeah. right there. And it's like, why not go back to some of those amazing art jam ideas instead of scrambling for ideas for new levels later in the development? Mm -hmm. Really good question. Thank you. Really good question. Now we, we came up with what I thought you saw you do that brain board, high concepts for every level. Right. And then, um, and we, we just think it was really not fair to Jane's, which is we hired someone who'd never made a level before. Yeah. There were no other designers around except for our lead, lead level designer and, and, um, project leader. I'm like, okay, you got to make up this first game. And by the way, these levels have to completely tell the story they need to tell. They need to thematically fit in with the game. They need to be like something. Wow. No one's ever seen before. Have a big holistic concept that you can rock. Like the second you start playing the game, you start to have to make people cry. <laughs> yes. They do all these things. And it's really, and then we said, go, go off and then come back and pitch it to us. And I don't know why it was set up that way. That was the biggest mistake in some ways of the project, which was that, because when we did, you know, the first games, we brainstormed together, like all the level designers and stuff. Like, well, how, what's this level going to be about? Blah, 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 blah. And that's, and then eventually sometimes the designer says, I know enough, I'm going to go off and design this. And they come back and they fill it in with all the realization of all those ideas. But um, like we had this idea of it being a wet, dry thing. But uh, when right. they tried to make that work, they couldn't make it work. So they jumped to another idea. And I was like, what's this idea? This is, what's the, I don't even see the idea here. What's going on? And, 
Um, I learned some things about that. Like we should have bring some together just so like you start a project, having all your leads design the first thing together as everyone kind of, especially with like a game where you need to figure out what it is. Um, then all the leads from every discipline know what you're making. We've made one of these. Let's make a whole bunch more. Yep. And, um, I also had an idea when I was watching it. It's like, I, f I wish I had asked for like key art for the level. Like if you could make a, if you could summarize in an image, like Edgar Tegley is building a house of cards up to his ex-girlfriend's face in the sky. And there's a raging bull that keeps knocking it down. Like if you could build that image that tells the story of that level and I, oh, I know what we're building. I know what, what not just what we're building, but what it means, you know, what journey the player is going to go on, what problem they need to fix, what trouble the main character in the mind is having. And um, like none of those, none of those pitches, like it's really had that kind of, idea of key art even a description of the key art so that's that's my new idea for next time but <laughs> for next time i think that's if we'll ever make one again but yeah yeah um, for every level that's it so i mean you talk about the ideas kind of rolling along and you get to see them and you're like what the hell is this uh, another recurring theme and i'm sure you picked up on this uh, subtle recurring theme for those documentaries people being like where is tim what what does he do where were you that whole time uh, not an accusatory way but were you just writing or what, what was happening why that doesn't come across in the documentary I thought they covered that because I've seen some people going like, well, the main problem is Tim's not here. Right. And like um, Tim was working on another project called Don't Never Miss Payroll, which was, you know, it's not really I guess it's just not shown as much. We talk about it, but Greg and I were traveling the world trying to like find some railroad track to lay in front of this train so that we could not crash. You know, we, were, we had right. we had so I realized, you know, we started the. Um, we started the crowdfunding campaign. There was a publisher who was like, yeah, we want to do this. We not not signed or anything, but they're like, yeah, my boss like said, we're going to start negotiations. So we like felt good about launching it. And then they came back with, actually, we don't want to make games anymore. <laughs> like, oh, God. We, we had to leave the industry. I was like, wow, we really did a number on them. And so then we spent <laughs> the rest of the time from launch of the Kickstarter to, and that's why I like, you know, to, to signing with Starbreeze. That entire time was just me and Greg you know, trying to get um, publishers, so trying to every publisher, trying to get investment money from China, trying to get investment money from Sweden, and like flying to Sweden and barfing in Ubers and just doing a lot of stuff. It was like an incredible, like full time job just to make sure that the and we came back finally with to the deal. And then again, with the acquisition, we had to do it twice to bring in money right. so that the team got paid and we finished the game. And then people are like, well, I see the problem is we need to have Tim in more of these meetings. And then we'd be having a different thing of like, Tim, why aren't you out getting money? Because we're now out of business. Why didn't you do that? So what the that's the thing I everyone should learn and that I've learned from working with programmers uh, and a lot of people, but especially programmers, because you got you're like, mm, the bill doesn't have this thing. I asked for lollipops in the build and they didn't need lollipops. And like, oh, yeah, we could have done that. But do you want that instead of save game? Like, right. No, oh, no, no, I want save game. But do you want it instead of camera controls? Like, no, 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 we got camera controls. Then the lollipops. Like, well, yeah, but we also need to do the nav mesh systems. Like, there's always, you always think someone chose not to do the thing you wanted, but it's really there was just a bigger fish to fry that they had to do that was way more yeah. important. Yeah, it was, it was striking. Like, after strawberries fell through, I felt so anxious watching that entire section. And like when y'all, you were just, uh, there might've been some chuckles about uh, Starbreeze and what was happening with the company at the time. And I was like, how is everyone not scared out of their minds right now? Is it, do you feel a deep fear or is it just a level of comfort of like, Greg's on top of it. We, I, I can sleep at night. Well, different people over the years have different reactions to that. And there's some people who are like, I can't do anything about it. I'm not going to worry about it because I'm going to keep doing my job and they're either going to do their job or not. And it's like being on a 747. There's not yeah. much you can do about it. And it is terrifying to think about the worst case scenario, but it doesn't really get you anywhere to think about it. There's not much you can do to help. Right. So, you know what I mean? And they can't help. Like if they're like, oh, we have a, we got a pitch, we need a great demo. And then the team can be like, we're going to help secure our future by making this great demo, you know? So um, some people are, they are really nervous about it. Some people don't want to know about it. Like, just just do it. Just fix it, it up. And uh, we, that's why we have that weekly meeting. It, it, it kind of started from people wanting to know what's up with the publishers. Are we going to get a deal on, on, you know, in the old days, on old games? Yeah. Um, were there ever any talks about filming some of the early acquisition discussions, or was it just agreed upon that all of that stuff was unfilmable? Yeah, I don't think they would have. I mean, they weren't, I mean, they weren't, say we're talking to someone who didn't end up buying us. Yeah. You know, why would they want that on film like, like yeah mm -hmm. some things are 
Or, uh, but I'm happy to tell you all about those meetings. You want to know all about them? Yeah, They're what great. we're talking about is a lot of just filming you and Greg uh, through a window in a very intense meeting trying to figure out what was going on. I mean, we talked about it a little bit uh, in other MinMax content, but like, I'd imagine a big point of reference for you was just talking to other folks, you know, who were acquired by uh, Microsoft yeah. early days, talking to Fergus and, I don't know, Brian Fargo and stuff. Like, a lot of the fig compatriots, that uh, was a nice just to bounce ideas off them just to get a sense of what this would be like to make you less scared of the road ahead. Yeah, because I mean, you know, Fergus and, and Brian and I had been, you know, met at various things and did a lot of crowdfunding stuff together. And um, and I could talk to them and find out, is this true what they're saying? Are they really going to leave us alone and let us do our thing? And they were right. like, oh, yeah. yeah they, um, they have, I mean, they, they, I, they're they different. You know, we worked with them 20 years ago when they used to send down a lot of people to, like, ask us how we're going to make our um, shaders and stuff. <laughs> and like, um, I'm like, I don't know why you're sending someone down to feed it. But um uh, and then, you know, I don't know if it changed around the time, but they had a big success with how they integrated or didn't integrate Moyang, you know, into the studio. Right, right. Like, let's not, that they're doing good. Let's not, <laughs> you know, just figuring out whether you can add value or not, I think is, is an important question. And I think um, there's a different mentality of like, well, let's, you know, we have money to invest, we can acquire these studios and like, how much... What, you know, there's a lot of people would make the choice of like, well, I know we know more than these people that we're buying how to be the, do their best job well. So let's just go and intrude them. And like, it just doesn't work out. Right. I right. think they've been, they have a really great philosophy about that. And, um, and it was, you know, talking to Matt Booty about that, that kind of changed my mind about being independent. I mean, one of the most amazing little moments of the documentary is when Matt Booty is walking through the studio. I think maybe the second time he was there. Um, maybe the first, I guess, because you're giving the tour and explaining two player productions. And you're like, yeah, yeah we just filmed all of our meetings. Yeah. And he goes, wait, for real? Like, <laughs> it just seems like you just cannot comprehend. Because I think you even make some reference that a lot of the stuff that Microsoft has filmed is like, oh, that's just for like internal use only, whatever. So the idea of like, oh, this is going to see the light of day someday. So I'm just curious, what has been Microsoft's feedback on the documentary so far from your perspective? They just, you know, they knew about it and they asked if we wanted, you know, help advertising it and stuff like that. And I think it's like, um, it was a, one of the things we'd started before the acquisition and they were very clear about like, you get to fulfill all of your commitments right. that you made before the acquisition. That was a backer reward. So we had to do it. And I think, um, it's, you, you know, we have to earn their trust. They earned our trust and we earned their trust by, I wouldn't actively try to hurt them or put anything in the doc to like, cause I think the story is great for them. You know what I mean? It, you it, see it, all yeah. the struggles we're having because it's inherently, uh, rough situation and they show up and they'd be like, what kind of game would you make if you had resources? And we're like, oh, man, you know? and, we, um, and it totally changes our life as a studio. And I think it, um, it reflects great on them. And that's why I feel totally fine sharing that story is because I think it, um, uh, it's not bad. It's not bad for them. You know? Yeah. Do you have to have conversations with them? Do you get to have conversations with them where you get to make that explanation of, you actually look really good in this, uh, Microsoft? <laughs> well, we have like, you know, it's called a limited integration studio, which means, you know, navigating like how involved to get is a big part of it because, right. you know, they, they have to do certain things certain ways. And so, um, you know, we, we decide on our end what, you know, what's, what are decisions we can make, you know, and then, and, you know, if certain things come up legally or something like that, we're like, we, you know, that we have to, we have to involve Microsoft, but we don't do that unless we have to, because we can take care of things on our, at our scale that make more sense for our scale of operation. Yeah. So is the implication here that, uh, the documentary and, and the wild push for a huge documentary like this, it's kind of, it was grandfathered in and it's a little bit like Amnesia Fortnite where, you know, at least from the documentary, the conclusion from Matt Booty and folks is like, well, Next time we do one, we'll have to have a discussion about exactly how this works. Um, they have not said anything. They have not said anything like that. I think. Yeah. I think he says they had some line. We're talking about Amnesia Fortnite, and like when that it comes was to about ownership of. Right. Oh, I'm sorry. I think about do documentaries. Yes, um, yes, yes. So for Moonlight, Fortnite, they say, well, we have to straighten that out, which means like yes, we could you know do that. You know, just make it more clear on paper and stuff, which right. isn't true for in general. There's a lot of things as indie that you're like woohoo high fives and then later on like maybe that should be a piece of paper instead of a high five right right um but the, the point is is a little bit like that amnesia thing for the documentary situation where you feel like if you were to start a new big documentary now it'd, it'd be a slightly different process than before no i don't think so. okay that's great to hear um do you feel like your life is significantly better since the acquisition do you feel a, a wave of stress wash away dave russell yes <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. Really? What, i mean I, and, but it's funny, and this is, I think about the two player guys going through this, whenever you've been through something really traumatic, like the last 20 years of running a company, um, and you go to bed every night, you're thinking like, 
how am I going to pay everybody in three months? You know, and it's like all those people. And you go to bed thinking that every night for a long period of time. Um, and you don't feel it. You're like, oh, I wonder why that isn't killing me with stress. And people ask you sometimes, they're like, how come you're not dead with stress worrying about the bank? And like, I don't know. And then now that everything's fine, I'll be laying in bed going to sleep and I'll have one of these jolts. I'm like, oh, geez, how am I going to? And I have to be like, uh, it's okay. It's okay. You don't, you can pay everybody. <laughs> Look, and, I, and my theory is always like when you're going through, it's like when I pitched full throttle the first time, I was really nervous about this pitch. So nervous. And then we all got in the room and Lucas starts and I pitched the game. People are like, oh, this looks great. We like it. And they, they like approved it right then. And everyone left the room. And then I sniffled like that. And I realized I have a cold. And I had no idea that I had a cold until just that moment. And then I started feeling really sick. And I was like, oh, my God, my body was like, he can't handle the cold right now. Just don't, <laughs> don't tell him about the cold. Let him do the pitch. Right. And the pitch is over. He's like, OK, we're safe. Release all the fluids. And so like, um, uh, so you're saying are, are great now. But this is I feel like my body is slowly releasing 20 years of stress as I can take it every day a little bit as right. I'm falling asleep. <laughs> Which is now, this is why you get COVID now, I'd have to imagine. Yeah, because now it's just getting I, I know, I don't so want to relaxed. Talk about because I know it's not serious. It's like going to war or anything. But I feel like your mind protects you from trauma. And then when things are peaceful is often when you feel it more. Which is why I think there's like things like post-project depression for people. Because right. their brain protected them so they could do their job. And now they have a peaceful time. Their brain's like, okay, by the way, here's all the news you missed. And here's all the tears you didn't cry for the last, you know, you're there. Have, a, have fun with that. Yeah. So you luckily, if you're lucky, your brain just meters it out. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, seeing feedback out there online of um, people asking where you were, why you weren't in meetings and stuff. Are there other misconceptions out there about the documentary or just comments that are frustrating to see? Oh, it's all wrong. Because right. This is all the Paul's fantasy movie. No, I uh, misconceptions. I mean, uh, I probably I bet. I feel it's safe to say that almost everybody behaved worse. Paul talks about this a little bit. He's like, we're not into the, the business of showing everybody's worst moment. Yeah. You know, I just think some documentaries would focus on their worst moments because that's the best juicy moment. Right. But like, is that really representative of that person, that meeting where they got the lowest, you know what I mean? So um, I'm, I can think of, you know, worse things that were there. They have, they have tapes of everyone acting much worse, but I, I don't know if that's a misconception documentary or just like a choice of what story they wanted to tell. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you feel like um, this is a big question, maybe a simple question. It, is this it? Is this what the development of Psychonauts 2 was like for you? Do you feel like it's capturing the essence of it? Or is there still when you look at this documentary, you're like, well, that's close to feeling what it was like. But, you know, you it's, can never it's quite just, capture it's a it. Take on it. It's a take on it. And it's a right. deep take. And it's a take of a lot of things that I never saw. So it's like a, a, a better it's like a, a tape of a lot of my blind spots and stuff. So. It's great. And it's, it is really deep. Of course, we all have our meetings remembered and our problems that we went up against that aren't on the, that aren't on the doc. They couldn't have been filmed or they weren't filmed or um, I think I told you about that, like the missing publisher one uh, was a big thing that um, was on there. I don't know. There, of course. But I don't think it means that that is anything missing. Yeah. Right, right. It's their version of it. Are there, are there any scenes that, um, say, five years from now when you're feeling nostalgic and go back and watch it that, that you wouldn't want to rewatch? Do you feel like there's any moments that are a little too intense for you and you don't want to sit through it again, or is it all it all gravy? Yeah. I mean, mostly, it's mostly the world. Lowest part is that, that meeting that everyone talks about because yep. I, I just completely regret everything about that meeting. Like, I wish I'd oh, really? never had that meeting. Some people are saying it's a very important conversation to have, but I was like, no. Our art director said something on Slack. One of the programmers said something about it. I should just let those two opinions stand and just like, that's great. You're both entitled to your positions on this. I don't need to get involved. I just naively was like, oh, there's a misunderstanding about how we're going to solve our problem here. I'm going to just head this off in this meeting be like, we're not going to solve this problem by crunching everybody. And um, and they just turned into this crazy circular thing. It just got spinning and spinning and worse. And I just should have shut it off before any of that got any farther. But um, uh, um it was it was tense because I um, and you can see on my face when uh, our our um, when Carol says we're never we're never slipping past that date. I'm yeah. like, oh, I don't know why she's saying that because we're totally blowing past that date. I don't know why, <laughs> but I don't want to like then you but you don't want to like in a meeting like undermine people who work for you by like right. contradicting them, making them look bad. And so I'm like, what do, do I say something or do I not say something? I never could figure that out in that moment. And um, we had this we we knew we had this much time left and like this much game to make. Yeah. So like, how are we going to make up that thing? And that's what, you know, Amy's right to just be nervous that we're going to make it up by crunching. Um, 
but I'm like this crunching would not make this up. This is not going to be made up. But crunching will get you like this much. Like crunching is not that effective of a tool for. It's uh, going to be. I'm like, what we're going to do is we're, I'm probably going to go get more money from Microsoft, and right. um, that's how we're going to solve the majority of this gap. You know, and people will. There probably will be some long hours for some people here and there. Um, or for a bunch of people, if we, you know, if certain things happen. And so, um, it's good to be, it's good to be worried about it. I just, I just, uh, it's a great lesson in that. I just, it's really hard to not take things personally when you're a manager, because no right. one wants to hear about your feelings as a manager, but I like, I couldn't help but take that really personally. Cause someone was talking about how I treat the employees and I'm like, and they're like, don't ask me to trust. And it's like, I, I, you know, I was feeling like I, um, I'm not asking. I've been showing. I've been earning the trust of this team since 2005. After second shift, I've been earning by working on not crunching. Mm -hmm. I've been earning trust with them, not asking them for trust, just earning it. And then someone new comes in who's never shipped a game with me. He's like, "I don't. I think you're going to exploit the team." And I'm like, "It's really hard to like. Just I should have just said, okay. I'm just going to all earn your trust eventually. Hopefully, um, it's how I should have answered that. But instead, I was like, yeah. "You, bleh. yeah." And I think. You know, uh, Everyone, everyone's human once in a while. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, you say you shouldn't have had that meeting. Like, I, again, I don't know. This is none of my business, but the documentary, the weird thing is it, it makes it everybody's business a little bit, right? But like watching, it's like, I feel like, and it's even expressed that it's nice that this meeting is allowed to happen. That in a lot of studios, that wouldn't happen. It's just like, Slack's no way to get something that nuanced across, like just letting those posts stand. Like, but still, you feel like it was a net negative to even... Yeah, because I feel like that wasn't the venue to have that conversation. Like, yeah. a lot of people didn't want to be there for that. People were like, "We're not involved in this. We don't. We don't have a. You know, I don't. You know, right. I don't have this issue or whatever." But it was a team wide meeting. Everyone was there, and once it started, it would have felt weird to leave. And so a lot of people just didn't want to be there. Some people did want to be there, and they didn't want to talk about this issue because they care about crunch a lot. You know. Yeah. Um, and so it's good for that, but we should, have, we should have had like a crunch meeting. Hey, everybody who's interested in talking about crunch, come sure. to this meeting. Sure. So that half the people could have been like, F no, <laughs> just <laughs> like, I do not want to be there for that. Um, that would have been a lot more fair, I think, for people. And um, it's just it's just an ongoing, I think about crunch, I've been thinking about it for many, many years and, and, and fighting it. It's, it's a real tricky thing. Um, and it's not as clean cut as a lot of people think it is. Right, right. Um, okay, Dread, the first time going through the documentary, watching it. Um, is it emotional for you? Are you crying? Are you laughing going throughout this thing? I mean, it's just there's so many little joyful moments of the... It's a very charming and funny team. I don't know if you know yeah. so this. Everybody's funny. Like, Levi just getting so... He's just so funny in the thing. Um, and just... But everybody... And, I, you know, I don't want to call them characters, but they're characters in the documentary. Just, like, seeing the different personalities like Jeremy Natividad and his journey through it where he's very quiet and soft-spoken then he gets mad and then he's like okay and then right. he's like hey, taking it in stride and, um, and watching what happens with James and I feel like and then the inspiring one of Asif you know that so uh, who just by being such a jerk gets promoted as we know, uh -huh. you know with Asif but, yeah yeah uh, do you um once it's out there do you reconnect with a lot of people I'd imagine a lot of folks in the documentary want to talk to you about their thoughts on it if they were at the studio and left i mean or is it just kind of like a i don't know I mean, some do some don't yeah some do some you know it's definitely um i've talked about it a lot with some people who have left and some people have never heard from again but okay. um you know some people left just so very close to the studio and we always just i'm always slowly tricking them to come back but okay still optimistic about anna is that what's going on here i said still optimistic about bringing anna back well i don't know if optimistic is a word but okay. not giving up that's for sure. <laughs> okay, that's nice. Uh, I know it's a big question, but what's your takeaway? Uh, watching this in a way that few people can. I mean, do you have things on your bulletin board of like, okay, I need to act this way moving in the future? I know we've dabbled with answers here and there for it, but is there kind of an overall lesson for you? I mean, the biggest lesson was like needed to really identify what our company's values are. Yeah. So that with new people and with existing people, we can talk about these things and be like, this is who we are more deliberately than just having it happen by accident mm -hmm. in the background because everyone was nice. Like we tend to hire a lot of nice people and they just made this nice culture. And we actually have to write down in case we hire someone who's a little less nice, right. um, but or a different kind of nice. Um, so we've done that doc. I've got it reviewed. It's about to go in the employee handbook, you know, the finalized thing and yeah. want to have a, a meeting about it. Cause I think it's still, it's still, you know, people forget these things and, and it's important to remember why they're, um, why they're critical. You know, so that was the biggest change. Like, like I gotta write this stuff down. I learned a lot about the company by by having experiences like us too, and by watching the documentary. 
Yeah. What about, um, and this isn't to be a, a therapist session or anything. What about yourself? Like, especially in that section where you talk about like, you know, sometimes I'm joking, sometimes I'm super not. And I understand that'd be really tough. <laughs> like I wouldn't want a boss like that. <laughs> um, did you find yourself, you know, making any jokes in the documentary, just realizing the perspective of seeing more of where the other person's coming from and being like, oh God, I regret that. Uh, interesting. Are there any jokes in particular you're thinking of? I think it was the, look, the, the Benedict Arnold stuff, I feel like was rough. Exactly. I Very tricked you. Rough. That's exactly what I was hoping you said. Because yeah. No, I 100% stand by that joke. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, 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 I mean, I don't want to say too much, but Andy and I have, you know, we're so friendly and I, um, I have very strong feelings when I'm leaving. And I still think it's something I have a big issue with. Um, you know, it's not like the old days. Where in the old days, you never left a project because you'd never work in this industry again, right? And that's like a very sure. 1900s like thing. But it's not treated that way anymore, um, especially because the like, games take five years to make or whatever. Even you know, normal games take a long time to make. People leave games all the time. But once you become a lead, I don't know. I don't want to talk. I don't know how in depth I should get into this. But if you're a lead on a project, if you accept, especially a lead producer, lead programmer and you leave in the last six months of development, I have feelings about that. And I have standards about professionalism that are intense about that one point because the team is really counting on you and you're going to hurt a lot of people by leaving because someone's going to have to rise up, take your position. Someone's going to have to rise up and a lot of your work's going to have to get covered and you're doing a lot of damage because some other job opportunity came along and you couldn't wait three months. You couldn't wait six months. I just, I, I, I stand by that betrayal joke because it's much lighter than how I actually felt. Okay, but Sometimes then you have to make a deal with yourself of like, no, I'm not gonna be that mad, but okay, if you just I'll let you make this one joke. One joke then, goes by. But it must be a situation about, of, about it afterwards. I told him how I felt in a less jokey way, but we I still told him I liked him because it's hard to not like Andy because he's fun at parties. Yeah, but I mean that's the magic of the documentaries. You probably watched it for the first time and saw how stressed out he was and felt even more for his position of being untenable it felt like for his brain to be in that spot no more sympathy for him no was it <laughs> no more sympathy for andy okay hey look these relationships are complicated we um i have sympathy for everybody it was hard i mean i definitely have sympathy for any producer who works with me because it's tough because when the person in you know like you have this we're this crazy collection of creative clowns of three c's i'm really into the alliteration today but like they own it all these creative people and they're sitting around trying to get somewhere, but they're, you know, dreaming up ideas. And the producer's like, I'll help, I'll help pave the road so you can get to town. And then you're like, okay. And they pave this road. And then they look back and all those circus people have wandered into the woods to find this deer. You know, like, where are you, <laughs> where are you f- going? I can't, I made this road for you. And you're like, yeah, but this deer is really important. Hold on. <laughs> so that's, that's a hard job. That's a hard job to do. But, um, Okay. Uh, I do respect uh, producers a lot, and I think sometimes it's, it's more fruitful than others. Yeah, right on. Hey, uh, thank you so much uh, for allowing this to happen, for having a studio that is this bold and allows people to film this much. It, I don't think it'll ever happen again. Uh, I think this... We're doing it. <laughs> all right, please do. Please encourage I, I, it to happen again. I hope I disagree, because I, I, mean, I do disagree, because of that thing I was saying where, like, people seem so concerned about sharing this stuff and it's yeah. not bad stuff. It's like, if you think you're, if your standards are so high, Jason Shire, <laughs> that you can't accept <laughs> that not just people make games, but uh, managers are people and everyone involved in the whole chain up to a certain level are humans. And they, um, no, they, it, it's like <laughs> the good and the bad of it. Like people, it's a weird industry. Like I've mentioned in my, um, one of my talks recently that, uh, we're not, there's not much management training in the games industry. You're mostly made yeah. a manager because you had an idea for a game, mm-hmm. which is not the right reason. And so half sink and half swim and half hurt a bunch of people along the way. And as an industry, we're trying to like get a grip on like, how do we get real management training? How do we get better at this stuff? And I feel like this documentary is part of that effort. Like, look, here's what the best mo- the best abilities, this is what we came up with after all the years of our experience, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, it's not bad to share. It's a, you be loud about your mistakes. Uh, if you really, um, unless you really, if you are not a jerk about it and you're honestly doing your best work and you are actively trying to do better each time and learn from your mistakes, people are very understanding and give you a second chance most of the time, right? It's when yeah. you try to hide that information and be like, I didn't make a mistake. I didn't do anything wrong. Ba-da-da-da-da. Then people, then you have someone like Jason write an article about you because they're trying to get in there and be like, we need to cover this. You know, it's just, it's better to, it's better to tell your own failures so that someone yeah. else doesn't tell them for you. Did a lot of people give you feedback about the documentary at, at DICE? 
Does you have other developers or publishers be like, you know, it's hours and hours long. I don't know if you know it doesn't it doesn't feel that way. It's just past when you're watching it. That's but right. It's many hours. Like, I don't think they had time. A couple of people did, but okay. it's like you would have had to binge it that weekend. Yeah, um, like a maniac. A really, crazy person would binge it on the opening weekend. I really opening weekend. I really think that I, I hurt my neck from being like laying on the couch just watching it for a full weekend. But dude, it was worth it. Uh, it's gonna. I think it'll stand the test of time. I mean, this thing is gonna be. It's gonna be more and more fascinating. I feel like with each, each passing year. I mean, thirty years from now, fifty years from now, going back looking at this thing, it, it's it's incredible. So you know what, I Tim? I brought you on just to say hats off to two player productions one more time. I will pass along, even though you already met them. Okay. Thank you. Their they, awesome. they had no idea that you liked it. They, <laughs> they watched your podcast and were like, we just can't get a read on this. Guy. <laughs> Does he like it? Does he not like it? It's so damn good. Uh, anything we missed? Anything else you want to say? Get off your chest? No stuff, but well, next time. We'll talk about it next time. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you for watching. It really is nice to have you supporting that documentary because it, you know, we didn't know how people were going to react to it. And um, it's great to see it being seen for what it is, which is very honest and um, well made by a two player documentary. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well, thanks so much, Tim. And thank you, everybody, for watching or listening to this episode or this interview from MinMax. There's a whole playlist like it. Uh, you can watch Tim Schafer talk to Joseph Ferris about the development of, uh, yeah, let's see, It Takes Two and Psychonauts 2. There's a bunch of other fun stuff in there, so we'd appreciate it if you subscribe to MinMax's YouTube channel, or you can always support us on Patreon if you want to support it directly. All right. Thanks so much, folks. Goodbye. You've seen the headlines. You know that the media landscape is consolidating. Having truly independent games media is more important than ever. MinMax can exist independently as a place about games, friends are getting better, but we need your help. The good news is that it's easy. Just click on that subscribe button or unlock a mountain of benefits by going to patreon.com slash minmax with two N's. Thanks so much, everybody.